Great. Yeah. So welcome, everyone, to our Saturday session. We've got Reverend Grace Thomas with us this morning, and she's going to be talking about eco grief and eco anxiety, um, which is obviously a lot of what, what um, we do at CCA is about um, nonviolent direct action. But we do actually have as one of our um, purposes that we that we help people where possible to, to process everything that's going on um, with the climate crisis. Um, and <clears throat> so Grace is um, one of the coordinators of CCA Manchester, one of our local groups, and she's also a curate in Salford, and she's the Diocesan Environmental Officer for Manchester as well. Um, and I recently heard her speak about eco-grief and eco-anxiety, and it was really, really good, so I'm really pleased she can come and chat to us too. So she's going to be talking for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to have some breakout room time, and then we'll, we'll come back together at the end to, to be back as well. So I'll hand over to Grace. Hi, thank you, uh, Caroline, and it's, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for uh, joining on a Saturday morning. Um, I know there's quite a few people on holidays and things at the moment, so it's, it's good that this has been recorded so people can um, look back on it. I'm going to try and share my screen. There we go. Um, I'm just going to do a couple of things in advance. There we go. Well, I can't quite get it to. There we go, that'll do for now. So um, I'm going to talk about um, eco-anxiety and uh, touch on aspects of climate grief, give an overview uh, in 20 minutes, and then hopefully some end with some practical um, ways in which we can respond that we can then go into our breakout groups and have a bit of a chat more about. Um, if people want the slides afterwards as well, I can always provide the slides, that's not a problem. So just first of all, starting uh, with a definition about what eco-anxiety is. Um, and there are a couple of definitions up there on the screen. Um, a chronic fear of environmental doom, the American Psychological Association called it in 2017. And Glenn Albrecht, who's written quite a lot on um, climate grief and climate emotions and his book, um, Earth Emotions, uh, which was published, I think in 2019, is, is I'll be referring to that later on and it's a really good book to read in terms of uh, understanding a bit more about climate grief and emotions and he um, says that eco-anxiety is this generalized sense that the ecological foundations of existence are in the process of collapse so there's this acknowledgement that there's there's something um, happening that is really very very significant and um, and therefore this invokes within us um, these emotions that we uh, term as eco-anxiety. Now, how it's being manifested, um, we're learning more about this um, and, and more studies are being done um, as we recognise that this is becoming more widespread. It's increasing unsurprisingly amongst young people and uh, Caroline Hickman has done quite a bit of research on that. You can just Google her from Bath University and you can find quite a bit of work that she has done. One of the biggest things that young people, um, how they experience anxiety is to do with the dissonance, particularly around what they hear adults saying and what they see adults doing. And then this creates this dissonance because often what adults are saying does not reflect what's actually happening or what they are doing in response. And this can increase anxiety in our young, uh, our young people, uh, children, teenagers and young adults. Symptoms of eco-anxiety can include things like despair, restlessness, depression, eco-paralysis, which is this feeling that it's so overwhelming that you just can't do anything about it. And so it can come across as that you don't care, but actually it's just that you care so much that it's almost become so overwhelming that you, you can't, it, it's, it's preventing you from doing something about it. And there are maladaptive ways of coping too, um, most commonly denial, so pushing it to one side or distancing. The thing with eco-anxiety, this type of anxiety is, that it is something that is going to be ongoing. And so there has to be ways, and I'll come on to this in a minute, ways of how we learn to live with this well. Um, trying to deny it or trying to distance ourselves from it will not actually in itself um, take away the anxiety, but what it tends to do is that the anxiety will manifest itself in other ways that aren't necessarily healthy. Now, I've taken quite a lot of the work um, um, that I'm presenting today from a wonderful person called Panu. Um, the reference is below, and again, we can share this with you later. He's actually um, a priest in Finland, 
and they do he does quite a lot of work in Finland around um, eco anxiety and he's very aware that when we speak of eco anxiety in our context it's very different to those who are experiencing um, and have been experiencing the effects of climate destruction um, in the global south for example for many years now so we need to be aware of our context and that how our context um, shapes our eco anxiety in one way whereas in other places of the world it will be shaped in a different way Obviously, this is becoming more and more apparent, um, the effects of the climate on our own country, as we've seen with the floods and we've seen with um, extreme weather changes. And the BBC reported on a research uh, just yesterday about how the effects of climate change are affecting our country. Um, but what we need to acknowledge is that it's been affecting places in the global south um, for years now, um, quite dramatically. And so those, um, those, those people have been experiencing anxiety, even if it's not been named as such for quite a while now. Now, eco-anxiety is related to, I can never say this word, existential anxiety. And therefore it's connected to deep spiritual and theological questions. When we're thinking about eco-anxiety, questions about what the meaning of life is, is there anything more to this? All these kind of these deep questions come to the fore. Paul Tillich, um, created a model of existential anxiety um, and he, he named three particular things that were that were shaped um, how we um, what existential anxiety is and that is anxiety about faith and death anxiety about emptiness and meaningfulness and anxiety about guilt and condemnation all of these map out um, with an um, eco-anxiety so there's anxiety about faith. Where is God in all of this? Anxiety about death. What you know? Um, what happens um, in death? Death of us. Death of biodiversity. Death of species. Anxiety about emptiness and meaningfulness. Where do we find meaning in a world that's changing so rapidly? And anxiety about guilt and condemnation about our own part in this process. What we have done, maybe, um, and how that has made us feel um, about what's going on around the world. It's really, really important to remember that anxiety in itself is a helpful emotion. It's a natural, normal response, just as anger is, just as all these emotional responses that we have. And it heightens our awareness to situations that need attention. It's part of our natural response um, to help protect us and make us aware of what is going on. So anxiety in itself is an emotion that is normal and healthy and can be helpful. But the problem that we have often with anxiety is that it can grow and it can it, so it can dominate um, how we live our lives and 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 our thoughts and our ways of living um, that actually mean that we don't flourish and don't live the full lives that we're called to live one of the problems with anxiety is that anxiety increases in people who feel that they are lone voices um, feeling anxiety in a place that nobody else appears to be in can generate feelings of, you know, am I being dramatic? Does nobody else care? And that can fuel further anxiety. And I think one of the things that I've become very aware of is that whilst some of us are aware that eco-anxiety happens and, and is, 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 a, is a valid response to what's happening, we're not necessarily talking about it in the context that we're in. So in our churches, maybe, or our coffee mornings, it's, very, it's quite a difficult thing to sort of bring up randomly. But there are ways in which we can bring this into the language and I'll come on to that a bit later. And this helps other people who probably are sitting there feeling this anxiety themselves, but also feeling that they're alone in this. If we can start talking about it and naming it, we create spaces where that anxiety can be shared and therefore lessened and more easily um, lived with. So we need to practice manageable ways of living with anxiety so that hope and resilience can be strengthened. Liberating people from this consuming grip of eco-anxiety can increase our well-being, resilience and actually can empower people into social action. We have to recognise that this type of anxiety is not going to go away. And so we have to find ways to live with it, to manage it in ways that we can, um, that, that, that are helpful, whilst also acknowledging that this is really tricky stuff. 
So how can we respond? Well, it is important to engage with positivity and Alex will talk a bit about that later, but it's equally important, Panu talks about this, to acknowledge what he calls the dark emotions. And I think very clearly about, you know, in the Psalm, Psalm 23, when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there is a way in which we need to walk through this. We need to acknowledge that this is here. Um, and we need to, to be aware that sometimes just to sit in that and acknowledge that this is here is, is part of responding to the anxiety and to what is happening um, with our climate. But it is also important to not only just do that, but also to make meaning and to find hope. Meaning making is really important and hope related to meaningfulness is really important. But it's important that we, we do root this in meaningfulness rather than false optimism. So we hear quite a few, you know, it'll be all right, you know, in, you know we're going to get all the technology that we need and everything's going to be fine and it's all big, big drama. And, and actually a lot of that is false optimism and that far from actually reducing our anxiety actually increases our anxiety because we know actually that this is not the case. And this is what we're seeing in our young people. They're hearing um, um, people saying, you know, there's, it's not to worry about, there's all too big a thing and, and you know, it's all going to be fine. We're all going to be all right. But they're seeing the reality of what is happening. And this dissonance is actually creating anxiety for them. So it's really important that we do talk about hope, but that we talk about it in a meaningful and realistic way. And it's not about false optimism. Now, a bit of Greek here for, the, for the, those amongst us who like a bit of Greek. Um, koinonia. Uh, koinonia is Greek for basically for community, for the community, the body of Christ. And we live in a world where the individual is often prioritised. And this can be helpful. It's really important that we value individuals as individuals. But this individualization um, can lead to sort of privatisation and then the suppression of our dark emotions. We, we, we live within our own spaces and we don't share with each other um, what's happening. And we, we think um, the individualization of our society means that we're, we're looking after um, ourselves um, and what we can do, what we can achieve. And this can help, this can sometimes be quite unhelpful in terms of acknowledging these wider emotions. So it's really important that we find ways to participate together as the body of Christ. And communal engagement in grief and anxiety can be an act of love that really can bring around transformation. When we bear the unbearable together, it can bring healing and it can create new relationships and it can energise the demand for justice. Um, we're very aware, you know, of the, um, you know, um, bearing each other's burdens is, is mentioned in Galatians, for example. And I'm really taken, um, and I've spoken about this before in other forums, so I'm really sorry if I'm repeating myself to some, but I often, certainly pre-pandemic, would conduct funerals um, in our community um, we have a large, um, large Afro-Caribbean community, often um, Jamaican um, people from Barbados, places like that. And when they have a funeral, everybody comes. And I don't just mean, you know, all the family. I mean, people that might have known about this person who died um, from the shop or something like that. We can have 200, 250 people coming to this funeral and they all gather around the grave and they all hold each other and they sing. And they hold each other together in that grief. They break down together, regardless of how close they were or how close they weren't to this person. They do it as a shared communal act. And for me, this brings an image to me of this breaking down together, which creates this rich compost from which we can make hope and new life and, and, and transformation can happen. So I'm really um, interested in how we as communities find ways to gather to break down together and to make hope together. So Panu particularly talks about his role. He often speaks about this issue in the public arena through media. Now that might not be for everybody that can do that on here, but what he's trying to do there is name this, get this out there so that people who are maybe sitting there thinking about it and thinking they're the only people feeling this, um, realise actually that they're not and this is all part of helping that process. Giving names to the emotions is really helpful too and Glenn Albrecht whom I mentioned earlier has written a book called Earth Emotions in which he names some new emotions to sort of describe how you might be feeling. Solastalgia is one that you may have heard of by now which is about homesickness for the land that we're in right now. So this idea that, that where we're in the world that we're in is changing 
and we have this homesickness for the way it used to be and, and what, how it's what it's becoming. Terra Fury is Earth anger. It's this anger that we have with what's happening to our Earth and anger towards people that we feel are, are perpetuating this. Topo aversion, I found, is a really useful term for where I serve because we do have a lot of people in our congregations from, um, from Barbados, like I say, Jamaica, India, Pakistan, all around the world. And places where their, 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 um, their homelands may already be being quite badly affected by the climate. And top of aversion is an aversion to go back to your homeland for fear of how it might have changed. So there's a, an acknowledgement that the climate emergency is changing places that we once knew. And maybe we don't actually want to go back there because of it. Naming these emotions affirms and validates what people may be feeling but have been unable to articulate. And um, when I did a session a couple of years, uh, well, probably about 18 months ago, a pastoral care session, um, one of the students suddenly said, I'm so glad you've given this a name because this is how I have felt and I've never known how, what to call it before. So simply naming our emotions can be a really helpful start in our path towards addressing anxiety. Then finding spaces for grief expression and discussion. Now, if we're in churches or Christian communities, we, we, we often do find spaces to gather. So how can we use the spaces that we gather for this grief expression and this discussion? I'll come on to a few examples in a minute. They can either be these one-off events or part of regular liturgy. So we have in our, in our, if we go to church in our church services, we have quite a bit in our church services that lends itself very well to expressions of grief and lament. So our confession, um, we've got things like the Psalms and the, um, that we, you know, are fantastic, um, have fantastic um, words and, and rich with um, grief and, and language that can really help us. Um, and, and so we can, we can look in at our intercessions and how we're using our intercessions so we can start bringing these spaces into the regular rhythms of our life, as well as having these really important one-off events or times when we um, get together. Public witness, so that's either um, as communities speaking to leaders, this is, you know, and, and voicing, giving our voice um, to this. And, and in doing this can help us to feel like we're participating in something hopeful and proactive. And finally, engaging in small but meaningful acts of hope and restoration. Planting trees, going for walks, just um, being with each other and creating garden spaces. These feel like sometimes small acts, but actually these are the getting our hands into the earth and creating something together that's positive is a really helpful and restorative um, activity that can bring hope um, to, to communities and to people. So again, um, these are things that I think we can, we can look at how we can do in our contexts and think about how we might bring the, that these, these acts to help people um, address these emotions that people may be feeling. I'm going to give you a couple of examples before I finish. Um, so the first two pictures on here are actually of a Christian Climate Action vigil that we held in the centre of Manchester. And we simply got together, it was an interfaith vigil, so we had people, we had a, an imam there speaking, we had a rabbi speaking, um, and then somebody from um, a, a, a vicar was speaking, but we all gathered together in the centre of Manchester and prayed and, and sang and lamented and and just um, created prayer flags, as you can see in that first picture. It was very simple to actually do and organise. Um, and it was just, but it was very powerful. It felt very much like we were together in this and, and that, that, that something very transformative was happening in this space. The, second, the third picture is actually a carol singing event that we did in Salford. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I changed some words to some well-known Christmas carols um, to reflect the climate emergency. And we then took them out and, and sang them in, 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 in busy spaces. And again, that was a simple act of getting together, but feeling like we were doing something quite positive with that and engaging with people on that. I wanted to show you this, though, because this happened very recently and it really got me thinking about how we use our spaces. And you'll recognise this when I show you. It's a very short clip.
so many of you will recognise that it was in the news um, a few weeks ago after the awful events that happened after the football. Um, and this, this, this mural is actually just up the road from where I serve. And it became a gathering place where people, um, you know, wanted to offer support, but where also a lot of the messages were uh, lamenting messages about, you know, how come we're still in this place where racism exists and, and what can we do? And I'm really sorry. Um, and obviously the people that were writing these weren't people that were themselves, you know, participating in any of the, the awful things that happened, but they found it was really helpful to, for them to gather and to offer um, words of lament and words of hope in a space. And it got made me really think about how we could use our spaces to gather, to, to, to enable people from across the community to, to offer words of lament and hope with regards to the climate crisis, because this is something that, that um, everyone across, you know, in, in our communities, lots of people in our communities will be thinking about. And maybe if we have church spaces, um, there may be opportunities there that we can offer it as spaces for people from the community to, to be, to, to offer that lament. I spent about 20, 25 minutes at this mural and it was a really powerful, all I did was stand there and watch. And it was incredibly powerful to be part of something that felt like it was a community coming together um, with a voice to say something, to lament and to offer hope. I won't show you this video because we uh, I want to get, leave enough time for discussion. One of the things that we have done is we've done eco fests in our churches where we've opened the church up to community groups and community activists to come and just share what they're doing. Um, and so the space has been opened up and, and um, for activities, uh, for local climate action groups, um, for young people who were doing stuff about recycling. And they all had stalls. And then people from the community came in and could have an opportunity to chat. So it really was just using the resource that we had, which was the church space, to enable people to come together to chat. So again, it's about thinking about what spaces do we have and how can we use them? Now, I've put some questions here for breakouts, but um, don't feel like you have to go with these questions. Your, your discussions may go wherever they go in their breakouts. But just a starting point if you're struggling, maybe to think about has climate anxiety and or grief been something that you have encountered or been in conversations that you've been involved in? And when we're thinking about creating spaces for meaning making, how do you think this could happen in your context? Has it happened in your context? Are there things that you can share with, with, us, with us today? Um, and so that's really it really, just an opportunity to sort of maybe process some of what we've talked about already and give some space uh, for some sharing. And I'll stop my screen now.